Well, welcome to our session on nuclear fission, not fusion. We may talk a little bit about fusion, but it's pointedly about fission. It's an interesting time for nuclear. Uh, we are entering a period in which we have a larger and larger amount of intermittent renewable power coming online, very low cost gas. Safety incidents in our past, not in this country, of course, but in Japan. And life has gotten hard for nuclear in some ways. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of innovation taking place. Markets are changing, and we're responding to markets in interesting ways. And we have a great group of speakers here today to share their thoughts from, from many different perspectives. Uh, and so let me just introduce them. It's an all Massachusetts panel, I'd like to point out. Uh, <laughs> I'll make that With case. one notable exception. <laughs> no, no, no. There is no escape, not even for you. Uh, first, Bob Etier, who is the Ethier, I beg your pardon, I said it in the Canadian way, who is the Director of Market Operations for ISO New England. Um, Jacopo Buongiorno, who is a nuclear engineer and professor of nuclear engineering at MIT and associate department head. I'm Rob Stoner, I'm the Deputy Director of the MIT Energy Initiative. On my left is Rita Barenwal, who is the Director of GAIN, the what is gateway. gateway for accelerated innovation in nuclear at Idaho National Lab. And on her left is um, uh, Clay Sell, who is a lawyer, no, an economist. No, I'm a lawyer. A lawyer. <laughs> I used to be a lawyer. I didn't know. I got, that it gets to a certain level. I, um, and the, more importantly, CEO of an exciting new startup in nuclear power uh, called um, X Energy. I'm going to start on, on my right. Um, with Bob and and Bob, tell us tell us what's happening. We, we're we're looking at at a situation where it's people are becoming concerned about a diminishing base load uh, and and contending with this intermittency, uh, and it's something that clearly will affect markets and market operations. And I wonder what you're seeing in the New England market. Well, we're right in the middle of it in New England right now. Um, we have uh, a number of nuclear units. Uh, they represent about 30% of the energy production in New England, um, but only 13% of the capacity. So they're clearly baseloaded as, as all nuclear tends to be. Um, but we are having those resources retire. We had um, the Vermont Yankee facility retire uh, a few years ago. We have uh, two months from now, we will have the Pilgrim facility retire, and that will leave us with only three nuclear units left. Um, and uh, it's sort of an interesting dynamic in New England in the sense that these retirements are economically driven, um, just like throughout the country, low natural gas prices are really affecting the nuclear economics. Uh, but the states are very um, pro CO2 reduction and spending lots of money and taking lots of action to reduce CO2 emissions. Yet at the same time, you have these baseload units that produce lots of carbon free energy are going away. Um, so it's very, um, the, the conflict between markets and policy is very clear in New England. Um, there's no sort of non-market driver that's forcing these units out. You know, they're not, um, for the most part, um, nobody's saying, oh, they should go away because they're unsafe or because we don't know what to do with the, with the waste products. Um, it's really being market driven. And then the states are, um, with varying speeds, trying to figure out how to keep these units around because they recognize that their, their very aggressive CO2 reduction goals are going to be hard to meet without nuclear. Um, while the states are actively spending a lot of money on um, rooftop solar, uh, they're spending a lot of money on wind um, and on hydro imports from Canada, that's, it's going to take a lot of money to make up for what a nuclear plant can do each year. Um, so it's, it's an interesting time in New England. Uh, you know, I don't, um, we also have uh, the uh, remaining nuclear units. Uh, two of them are engaged in negotiations with Connecticut about whether they should retire or not. And Connecticut wants to keep them around, but they're not sure if they want to pay the price. And uh, that actually is going to come to a head this Friday, is my understanding. So uh, we're a little bit early uh, to see how that plays out. But, Next uh, week's panel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, definitely um, uh, interesting times. Are you are you seeing impacts in the wholesale market of of 
retirements and imminent retirements? And Certainly. Panic in the streets? Uh, not panic so much uh, in the streets, but uh, what we did notice, uh, so when Vermont Yankee retired, which is a relatively small nuclear unit, about 600 megawatts, um, for the first time in a while, CO2 emissions actually increased. So we had seen a, a, a favorable trend of um, declining CO2 output as a result of moving from old oil and coal units to natural gas. Uh, but when VY retired, we actually sort of stepped back a little bit on that. Um, I think there are going to be concerns if um, Millstone 2 and 3, which are, the, which are over 2,000 megawatts of, of, of nuclear capability, if those do choose to retire um, after Friday, uh, they'll be concerned on a couple of levels. One will be CO2, but the other one is that um, New England, uh, you know, this is a nuclear panel, so I won't go too much into this, but we have a fuel security issue. And that really means that in the winter, our gas pipelines cannot bring us enough gas to, to meet all of our demand for gas. So the nuclear units are really key for um, helping us with that. So if they decide to go away, we may have sort of more imminent reliability problems. Let's see. Yakovo, you're, you're working across a broad uh, palette of, of innovation at MIT on nuclear power. Uh, what's your perspective on this, this sort of stuff? Yeah, so let me put my uh, answer in the following context. Over the past three years, I've been leading a uh, team of faculty and students at MIT uh, to execute a study that was titled The um, Future of Nuclear Energy in a Carbon Constrained World. And we were asking ourselves that question. What role can nuclear um, uh, play as um, uh, you know, different countries, the U.S. in particular, um, walk down the path of, towards decarbonization. And, and the answer is that there is a potentially very big role that nuclear, that nuclear can play. The attributes that make nuclear, in a way, an ideal partner for, um, uh, particularly for renewables, um, solar and wind, is that it's low carbon and it's dispatchable. So you can generate electricity when you need it. You're not at the mercy of, of weather and so on. And so I think the debate has been set up uh, incorrectly so far, it's not nuclear versus renewable, is nuclear and renewable. Or our analysis showed that the uh, highest uh, likelihood and most efficient path towards decarbonization of the, um, of the electricity sector in particular, but the economy as a whole, include a combination of, of nuclear and, um, and renewables. And what, what about the must-run sort of feature of nuclear plants? Isn't, isn't it something that, that is ultimately a penalty? So the, the, the reality is that um, in um, certain regions of the world, even the existing nuclear power plants are already following the load quite efficiently. Um, load following has been done in France for 30 years. In, in, in that case, they had so much nuclear that uh, a few units had to follow the load because the, you know, there, was, there was more, more uh, capacity than, than demand. And uh, recently in PJM, I don't know what the situation is in New England, the uh, nuclear units are actually following the load. Uh, quite aggressively, again, to make up for the, uh, you know, for, for the intermittency. But uh, this is for the existing, uh, existing nuclear power plants. If you now start to think about the future, the big hurdle is, of course, cost. We all know new nuclear power plants are, are expensive. And uh, the uh, magnitude of the role that nuclear can play is uh, strongly dependent on its cost. If the cost comes down, our analysis shows that uh, nuclear can play a, an enormous role. If the cost continues to escalate as it has, uh, it will play virtually no role, a very mm -hmm. small role. So then we analyzed um, the innovation paradigm, uh, innovation cycle of nuclear and compare it to um, other industries. And we found that it has what I like to refer to as the perfect storm of, of uh, disgraces. Uh, let me just sort of walk you through. Since I'm a professor, I can't help asking questions to the audience. So I want to do a little survey. These are going to be softballs. So you can <laughs> you know, play, play along. But uh, would you rather have given the choice a uh, technology that requires projects of the order of five or six billion dollars and take 10 years to realize or projects that put only a billion dollar capital at risk and takes less than five years? The answer is obvious. You want, you want the latter, not the former. Would you rather have a, uh, a, a product that is built in factories or one that is stick built a sprawling construction site? The answer is obviously I want the, the, the former, not the latter. By the way, interestingly, as part of the study, we analyzed or we, we looked at the productivity in different sectors of the U.S. economy and construction sector productivity peaked in the mid-60s, been declining since then. The manufacturing factor, on the other hand, uh, has seen productivity gains that have increased 
exponentially over the past 50 years. So you clearly want your manufacturing sector to produce your product, not the construction sector. But, but it sort of implies that there's a race against time there in terms of the decline in skills and the readiness of these new technologies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, there are a couple of technologies, I think Clay, Clay and, and Rita will, will touch upon this, that are actually available for, for deployment now. But let me, let me just sort of finish the little, the little survey because I think there is, there is a punchline that might be interesting to the, to the audience here. Number three, would you rather have a technology that, is, uh, that, uh, that requires for licensing a lengthy process that is very rigorous, and that's great, but it's uh, based on demonstration of a fairly complicated safety case, or you want something that is more robust that does not require that time? Again, the answer is, is obvious. And lastly, do you want to sell a commodity or you want to sell a high added value product? Again, the answer is clear. Now, if you think about nuclear as presently configured, large machines, stick built at sites with very lengthy licensing process, selling electrons, which are a commodity, they have their check all in the wrong positions. And so in a way, the challenge for this industry going forward for companies like X Energy and others that, uh, that, that are out there operating is to shift their innovation paradigm from what we have now, which is never gonna work, to checking the answers that are correct. Mm -hmm. And so now you're thinking smaller reactors, which could be built entirely in factories that have a much different um, safety profile that allows them to go through the licensing process quicker because you don't have to, you know, you don't have to, to, to uh, uh, analyze certain certain scenarios, and ultimately, uh, they're not just going to sell electricity. They may sell heat to uh, industrial processes. They may sell desalinated water in regions where it makes sense, and so on. So, decommoditize nuclear is also, I think, an important an important point. Of course, there's the time of day issue, which is another way of distinguishing yourself from the market. Let, let's turn to Rita now. Rita, I claim you from Massachusetts by virtue of your being an MIT undergrad. Fair enough. W welcome. <laughs> um, you run a big center at Idaho National Lab that's dedicated to advancing nuclear. Uh, what's your perspective? I mean, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? So um, let me remind folks that uh, nuclear energy is responsible for almost 60% of the United States clean energy. And so we have a really big role to play in, in reversing um, the effects of climate change. And that is sort of one big motivator for me to, to be in this industry. I'm not a nuclear engineer, I'm a materials engineer by degrees, but my first position out of graduate school was at Bettis Atomic Power Lab, and I had the opportunity to visit a shipyard watching the Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier be built. And as I stood in the reactor compartment, looking up many stories, I realized that the small fuel that I worked on, this little itty bitty bit of fuel, was so energy dense that it could power a behemoth aircraft carrier around the world. And that's when I started to appreciate the value of what nuclear energy provides to, to our country. Fast forward, and now I have two children, um, and the fact that they can breathe clean air around the world is a very important facet to me. And so that's, that's what drives me. What GAIN does is it helps private sector developers, be it a reactor developer like X Energy or an advanced nuclear technology developer, it connects them with the capabilities at the national laboratories in the United States to allow them to have access to technical expertise, to testing facilities, to reactors, to historical data, as well as some financial assistance and some regulatory assistance so that they can commercialize their technologies faster. And are you dealing with things like intermittency along the lines that, that Jacob was talking about? I mean, the real connection to the electrical system? There, there are, pro yes, there are projects uh, being led out of Idaho National Lab looking at integrated energy systems, of which one piece is nuclear, certainly, but also uh, renewables, and um, looking at output, not only electricity, but heat mm -hmm. um, and hydrogen production, for example, as well. So value adds, saving the fleet. Yes. In a sense. Yes, absolutely. So let me turn next to Clay and try to make the case that you're from Massachusetts too. Uh, this I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> By virtue of having served as uh, Deputy Secretary of Energy under Sam Bodman. Under the great Sam Bodman. Who is the great Sam Bodman uh, from MIT. Uh, so welcome on behalf of Massachusetts. And he drilled uh, uh, the brilliance and expertise of MIT into my head every single day that right. I work for him. So I have great regard for you and Jacopo and 
the Energy Institute that was founded what, about 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah, by, by uh, the great Ernie Moniz. Yeah. Who created GAME. Or did he? Did he establish GAME? Not a few folks have taken, taken credit. No, Ernie would certainly take so. credit. Sure. So can I put a, uh, a private sector company face on the top yeah. of Jacopo Gay? Uh, X Energy was founded 10 years ago uh, by an entrepreneur who had made his fortune in the space business, a guy by the name of Dr. Cam Gaffarian, uh, really because uh, he wanted to bring to fruition a technology that could uh, make a material change in the climate change situation, global poverty, global electric poverty, and, and you know, kind, kind of how can we bring clean energy around the globe. And so he looked at the very questions that Jacopo put to us all and endeavored to pick a technology for development that checked every box on the other side, the right side uh, of, of, of those questions. And so what we are doing today is really two things. We're developing a high temperature gas cooled reactor using a pebble bed fuel form, which I'll go into in a little more detail. And we've also gotten into the fuel business to produce triso fuel. Here's what is truly unique about our design innovation. The entire US and global nuclear regulatory system has been set up to address contain, mitigate, and prevent the worst case scenario of a melting fuel core and the re release of radionuclides uh, in an adverse public health situation off the site. That is what our entire system is designed to address. Uh, with special triso fuel, which is a specially designed fuel that is physically impossible to melt, that combined with our particular core design with a high temperature gas reactor, we design that consequence out at the very beginning. Now it's our job to go to the NRC and prove our safety case, to prove uh, with adequate assurance to the NRC that what I said is in fact true. And we're engaged with the NRC right now to prove that case. Are you engaged with Rita? I mean, does, does GAIN play a role? In GAIN does play a role indeed. Yeah. And, and so we are, pursuing 100% of the safety benefit that our design provides. And when we do that, the economics of nuclear power change dramatically. Not only do we get a much safer system, and by the way, safer than an exceedingly safe system that we have today, but not only do we get safety benefits, we get substantial economic benefits, and let me tell you why. When you remove the consequence of a meltdown, you can reduce by beyond an order of magnitude the number of safety systems that are built into a nuclear power plant. Each of those safety systems that you have to put in a traditional light water plant today have to be backed by a supply chain that is also regulated and certified by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so our ability to take all of those components off the board or largely off the board and replace them with commercial off-the-shelf components that don't have to be uh, procured from an ASME NQA1 in-stamped uh, certified uh, a supply chain is an absolute game changer as it relates to the economics of this plant. And so if we get the full safety benefit of our fuel, it changes completely the way you think about licensing, the way you think about manufacturing, uh, the way you think about construction. And we really regard our solution as the answer to what our industry has seen happen at South Carolina and at Georgia, where it's just become too expensive for the current generation of plants under the existing safety uh, requirements and with our depleted supply chain, it's just become too expensive to build those sure. generation three plants. So you and get an our technology is an answer to that. You get an inherently low LCOE if you're thinking about comparing the economics of your plant with a conventional nuclear plant, but you also have dispatchability by virtue uh, of the, uh, the design. The, yeah, there's a lo the load following is built into our design. You know, specifically to 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 be able to marry that with uh, renewables and 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 others. Mm -hmm. So have you have you looked at the economics, or are you close enough? To, to building a plant? I'm intimately familiar with the economics. <laughs> and, uh, and economics are challenged. Look, yeah. 
we need 100% of the safety benefit, uh, benefit of our safety case, but we also need some other things. Uh, you know, most of these components will be factory built, but there's gonna be some opportunities. We need to bend the curve down on uh, manufacturing costs through advanced technologies and additive manufacturing. Quite frankly, we need a commercial market that is shaped properly to reflect the true value of nuclear power. Uh, right now, the, the, the carbon-free nature of nuclear power largely goes unrecognized in the U.S. market. There are a few regional exceptions, but we need the full benefit of that. And so there are a number of things, manufacturing costs, licensing changes, getting the full benefit of our safety case, and alterations in the commercial market in order to make uh, all of our dreams come true for this technology. You're talking and with, about carbon so tax? So each one of those vectors or, 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 or a renewable portfolio standard or whatever, whatever. Look, call it what you want. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I've publicly advocated a carbon tax, but what I really advocate for is a properly shaped marketplace. And anytime someone can dump uh, a, a, you know, a costly ex externality into the system and pay no price for it, that's a negative. Mm -hmm. Consequently, when a, when a technology like ours provides tremendous benefit to the, to the marketplace, but is not rewarded by that marketplace, that's a limitation as well. And so I would seek to have that changed under any good theory of market design. There are more efficient ways, there are less efficient ways to do it, but there are many ways to address that market uh, inefficiency. Rita, um, I, I wonder how you're, you're, you're viewing this. I mean, you're, you're probably involved with a number of firms like Clay's that are developing these sorts of reactors. It must be tempting to pick favorites to try to push one or two of them across the line quickly. So, so right, I have to, I have to sort of the program. I have to check my technical <laughs> opinions at the door. Um, Gaines, Gaines' mission is to help companies accelerate their technologies and get through learning loops faster. And if that means that I have helped a company get through a loop and fail in a in a in a uh, experiment, for example, in six months versus three years, and that's a success because we've knocked off two and a half years for you to get to that decision point. Um, but there are, uh, let's see, to date, we've, we've impacted over 123 different companies that are playing in this space. All of those are not nuclear companies. Some, many are reactor developers. Others are uh, developers that are improving technologies to help our existing fleet. And others, going back to Clay's point about the, the builds in, that, that were occurring in South Carolina and are occurring in Georgia, are engaging with supply chain vendors along the way when the developers are developing their concepts so that we don't have the, the issue, we don't repeat the issue of not having engaged them. And then 40 years later, we expect them to be able to build mm -hmm. first of a kind without any schedule delays or, or budget overruns. So, so what sorts of timeframes are we really talking about here for implementing plants like yours or other plants built by, by firms that are pursuing other strategies? Are we talking about 10 years from, from where we are now? Some, some are saying 10, others are saying six. Um, again, I have to refrain from judging because uh -huh. my job is to help them get through their, their learning loops and their decision processes faster. Um, and, and DOE has had a change of philosophy, I would say in the, probably over the past five years or so, where they've decided we're, we're not picking winners. Mm -hmm. We're gonna let industry drive. We will support them to the extent possible. Um, but you know, the nature of the business will will uh, will play out. And we, I've heard a lot about startups throughout the course of today. And many of these companies are startups. And and we'll see, you know, what the statistics mm -hmm. the statistics are. But um, yeah, Bob, Bob, are you sort of anticipating that these these new systems will become part of the New England system and doing anything about it, or you just you <laughs> wait? Honestly, we can't see that far ahead. Um, we are currently um, overwhelmed almost by the uh, enthusiasm for wind um, interconnections. Uh, if you look at our queue, which is sort of how we look at what's coming at us, it's like two thirds wind and then of the remaining third, the bulk is natural gas and then you get a bunch of cats and dogs after that, um, including solar. And, uh, you know, is that, that a cat or a dog in New England, it's a dog <laughs> depends on if it's in northern Maine or southern Connecticut. Um, but, uh, you know, w we really haven't seen any evidence of that. We, you know, we get people come and talk to us about their new technologies that they'd like to bring into the market from time to time. But until we actually see them apply for interconnection and actually, you know, invest some money, 
you know, it's good to have these conversations. I mean, we're a bunch of sort of tech geeks at the ISO, so we're interested in, in hearing what, what your group does. But, you know, until there's something actionable, you know, we don't really start to plan for it. That said, you know, I don't see any, I mean, I think they would slide seamlessly into our market once the economics are there. How much time does it add to the, the um, viability or the, 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 the uh, bringing these things online to have to go through a, a, an approval process at ISO New England? Or uh, you mean, at the, so the interconnection process, it, a lot of it depends on where you're trying to interconnect. If you're trying to interconnect something big where they have small wires, it takes a really long time and a lot of money. If you try to interconnect something small with lots of big wires nearby, it goes pretty fast. I mean, you're still talking, let's say a year to do the studies and realistically, but in a time frame of, well, that we're used to for nuclear, that's a, you know, a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see it as an issue. Do you mind if I make a couple of comments about no, technology? I was, I was Again, working in academia, I have the privilege of not having to check the opinions at the, <laughs> at the door. Yeah. I'm also a nuclear engineer, so this is kind of stuff that turns me on. So if indeed the uh, time frame they were looking at is 10 years, then realistically there are only three technologies that could be deployed within, within that time frame. One is LWR-based uh, small modular reactors a la new scale. That's one option. Another one is, is clays technology, high capture gas reactors. And the third would be sodium cool fast reactors. And the Department of Energy has just recently launched a project uh, called the Versatile Test Reactor for a sodium cool fast reactor built at, um, at, uh, at the IDAO site. It's meant to be a test reactor, not a commercial, not a commercial demonstration. Right. Maybe I think you could say more about that, actually. Maybe. Say it again? Maybe you could say a little bit more oh, about well, that. Well, Rita, Rita works or, within, within the DOE company, so I'm going to let her comment on that. But I think from a commercial point of view, the first two technologies that I, that I have uh, mission are probably a little bit more interesting uh, for, for this period, 10, 10 years from now. Um, the, um, the, the other comment I wanted to make is about the role of the government. I, I completely agree with both of you. Said, you know, the government is not supposed to pick winners and losers. Uh, the, that whole model that the government leads directly the development of new technology and new nuclear technology is probably gone, gone for good, at least in the United States. We have examples in, in uh, other countries, China comes to mind, where, where the model is clearly different. But I think what the model that we need is a SpaceX for nuclear. So the government sets targets or goals and then invites mm -hmm. uh, technology options from industry and rewards the achievement of milestones with payments. We're just talking about the demonstration projects, not, not long term. And finally, we have either a power purchase agreement or some kind of tax credits. Once those demonstration projects demonstrate that that technology is achieving certain performance benchmarks, then the government comes in with, with, with a reward. I think that has worked fantastically well in bringing back the U.S. in a leadership position for a space. Um, it could work uh, just as well for nuclear. But SpaceX, I think we, we, SpaceX for nuclear, uh, nuclear X or whatever we want to call it, you know, would, be, would, be a good, would be a good approach. I just want to, we have probably about five minutes more. We'll go here and I'd like to leave 10 minutes at the end for people to ask questions. So this is time to start thinking about what those questions might be. So if I can touch on what VTR is, it's the Versal Test Reactor. And um, the DOE had been pondering this for several years and they solicited a lot of input from industry saying, what would you like to see in the form, if, if the government embarked on developing a test reactor in the United States, what would you like to see it be able to accomplish? And so it solicited this input from many, many members of industry, myself included, when I used to work at Westinghouse, and has come to the, the conclusion that we need to build what is now called the Bristol Test Reactor. It's going to be a fast reactor, and it was just recently announced that it will be built at Idaho National Lab, um, and the the reason the main one of the main drivers for it is that this capability does not exist currently in the United States. We have companies that are going overseas; they're going to Russia to do their radiation testing in certain cases, and um, we should have that capability here. We're, we're going to the Netherlands. We, we, okay. We're not a candidate for uh, VTR, yeah. but, uh, but 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 the we, we've allowed our capability and infrastructure from the supply chain, but also on the government side to uh, deplete substantially. Yeah. And uh, that makes reclaiming a leadership role in the United States a much more expensive uh, prospect. But I, I agree with Jacopo's view that, uh, and I respectfully say this uh, uh, to Rita, but the government has to pick winners. That's uh, our light water fleet is here. 
right or wrong, whether it was the right decision or wrong decision, it was the decision that the government, Admiral Rickover, made uh, in, in the early 1950s. He made the decision, and then our industry made it right for the time. And, uh, and it's, it's provided, a, it's been a, a tremendous, tremendous success, success story. But we need to innovate and do that again. And just the, the capital cycle involved and the quantum of, of dollars involved to develop these technologies and bring them to fruition and bring them to, to the benefit of society. Well, no reactor anywhere in the world has ever been developed outside of a robust public-private partnership. And, uh, and I think it's important that the United States recognize that, that some solutions cannot be simply uh, driven or incentivized by a marketplace. It requires you know, some long-term investment with a good government partner, and uh, I will continue to advocate that <laughs> to my great friend Rita. What do you think of Jacopo's idea of a SpaceX like platform? Maybe you need to say what a SpaceX is. Uh, no, no, it's, it, it's a framework that, that is, is quite compelling. Set the requirements, you know, Develop technology, step down, have a bake off at key points, mm -hmm. and uh, and and I, I think that's the way to do it. Okay, we've got we've got roughly fifteen minutes for questions. I see one. Yeah, uh, we have roving mics. There is roving toward you right <laughs> now. Could you just say who you are and where you're from? Yes. Yeah, that's more. I'm Ed Cronenberger. I'm a retired chemical engineer. You know, I'm. Uh, out there consulting as I can. I uh, spent 40 years in the industry, and one of the aspects of nuclear power, which of course I've always been interested in coming out of MIT a long time ago, is the, uh, the fuel cycle, uh, the fuel itself. An awful lot of uh, the public thinks about the, the reactors and uh, it's fancy machinery and everything goes on, but the invisible aspects are where that fuel comes from and who pays for its creation and development? Any comments? Anyone want to take that one? I mean, you're, you're asking about programs to, to create fuels and manage them? Is that something you can respond to, Rita? I, I'm, I have more expertise in the middle of the fuel cycle, but I, what I will comment on is that recently, um, DOE has recognized that there is a need for what's called high assay LEU. It's just a it's a fancy acronym, I guess, um, for it, uranium that's enriched between five up to twenty percent. Right now, five, up to five percent is what's used in our existing reactors. So they many, not all of these react these new reactors are looking to use high assay LEU. DOE has said, okay, we understand that this is a possibility. We're going to look at what storage supplies we have of such fuel or supply that we can make available possibly to get these companies started. That said, they're not saying we're going to fuel you forever either, right? But, but in the spirit of government support for these developers. Yeah. Grammaton, Westinghouse, General Electric. General Electric right. In the U.S. Yeah. X Energy will supply triso fuel. Yeah. Will you make your own fuel? Yeah. In fact, it's a key part of our strategy. We took, we decided early on to take the long pole and the tent of fuel off the table. And so we've invested substantially in our in, in the manufacture of triso fuel. We've been very successful with our DOE partners. Uh, we've secured almost $90 million in cost-shared grants uh, to develop a pilot triso fuel facility, which, which is actually at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, it's under testing right now. We're designing the commercial scale facility, which will just be a, we'll take the, the components, which are at commercial scale now in our pilot, pilot facility and just replicate that at the commercial scale. And uh, we'll apply for a license application at NRC in 2021. And, uh, and expect to be online in the mid-20s. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Aldous Boltudis, uh, Head of Strategy for NOC. Um, ten years ago or something, uh, I was uh, like seeing the hype of uh, ECAT and cold fission thing. And uh, the first thought was uh, like, oh my God, I need to sell the shares of the oil and gas companies, you know, like, because it's totally reshuffling the 
uh, world's picture from from perspective of energy. So I, I'm just wondering, can you share some opinions where it's going? Is it still on the radar of this scientific point of view? Or is it coming anytime soon, an observable future? Cold fusion? Cold fusion. So, does it we have can. to be cold? If, if you allow me to remove the adjective cold, I'll answer. <laughs> I think it, so, as far as cold fusion is concerned, I'm, I'm not on that side of the house of nuclear energy, but uh, it's been completely discredited within the scientific community. Cold fusion. On the other end, the uh, tokamak base, the magnetic confinement version of fusion is very much alive. And in fact, at MIT and in other places, there is now a new approach, which is based on high temperature uh, superconductors. This allows you to create much uh, stronger uh, magnetic fields. And my uh, friends who understand plasma physics tell me that the density <coughs> of the plasma is uh, proportional to the uh, third to fourth power of the, of the magnetic fields. In other words, if you double the uh, magnetic field, you can have a, uh, a density of the plasma, which is 10 times smaller. Why does that matter? Because it allows you to uh, design a machine for a given amount of energy that you get out of your plasma that is now 10 times smaller. So you can start thinking about prototyping and testing uh, devices with a net energy gain, which is sort of the holy grail, or at least the first step uh, towards a commercial fusion at much lower cost and, and compress a schedule. So stay tuned. It's not cold, but it's, uh, it's, it's very much alive. <laughs> no, no, it's still very much hot. We're talking about magnetic confinement, a few million degrees C still, but you know, it works. I mean, it's supposed to work. Okay, so I can maybe speak about the um, MIT project. Um, there is a, a startup that has been incorporated. It's called Cambridge Fusion Systems. It's a well... Uh, Commonwealth. Commonwealth, excuse me. Commonwealth uh, Fusion Systems is uh, very well endowed with, uh, with private money, uh, primarily from the um, uh, Italian hydrocarbon company ENI, but there are also some other, some other donors, and so they raise... I don't investors, know the exact figure and investors. It's and an stuff. interesting Excuse model. Me. They've actually formed a JV outside MIT mm -hmm. to fund research within the institute and then license whatever emerges what? back into the company and, and start building reactors. And, and Rob, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the target is to demonstrate the magnet technology within at this point two years. Two from years. Now. And the uh, and the actual um, they call it the Wright brother moment, which would be the first device that actually uh, demonstrates a net positive energy gain uh, within. Uh, 15 years? I think it's a decade. They're planning a decade. Very ambitious. Extremely ambitious. It's not a commercial reactor. <laughs> no, no, no. A commercial no, reactor no, is not. another decade beyond right. that. Demonstrate proof of principle. Proof of principle, yeah. Experimental proof of principle. I mean, the real, the real innovation here is magnets. Yeah. Is there was another question here? Sorry, but we are. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Brandon uh, Walters, uh, do uh, energy fundamentals for a large gas producer. Um, so, nuclear is not in my ballywick, but uh, w you spoke some to the depletion of U.S. capabilities in the in the nuclear sector. Um, was wondering, you know, as we look ten years out, you talked about commercialization ten years. Given that we lack some of the infrastructure and probably some human resources as well, given uh, that there hasn't been much in the way of nuclear happen in the U.S. for quite some time. Is that going to put some limits on how quickly nuclear could be deployed One, if there is a commercialized uh, SMR or other technology in you know, 10 years from now? So I guess but, everybody has a perspective on that. Yeah, really yeah. so, so I work a lot with universities. Um, and what I'm seeing is that there is no need for concern about the talent pipeline. Um, it is thriving. These, these students are very enthusiastic about this field. Um, and then there's a lot of, um, there are many knowledge transfer programs that are exist in the utilities and at these nuclear, uh, existing nuclear companies as well to ensure that sort of the bimodal distribution of, of staffing that we, we are seeing in the industry um, doesn't uh, cause kind of the demise of it. Um, and so there, there is a lot of attention being paid to ensuring that the talent pipeline is kept uh, thoroughly uh, uh, filled. Jacopo, I know you're not seeing a, a shortage of students <laughs> interested in that. In no, our, our undergraduate program has always been fairly small, but at the graduate level, we see actually in recent years an increase in uh, in, in uh, applications. What's driving the increase? 
a, a lot of it is actually uh, driven by international students. Uh, there are countries in which nuclear programs are um, look very different. In the U.S., they're thriving. Uh, China, India are the two primary examples. To an extent, South Korea, although the current uh, official uh, policy of South Korea is a phase out, and that will be reversed. So that's mostly driving it. Um, but if you look at the kind of um, uh, people that will be required to make this happen, it's uh, much broader than the nuclear engineers. Okay. In fact, I would say nuclear engineers is probably 5%. What you're going to need is qualified um, uh, technicians, electricians, uh, welders, oh, and so on, the crafts. Mm -hmm. we, we've so. got problems, and that's a challenge, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the snake closest to our boot. We've, we've had great success hiring tremendous talent, particularly at our facility down in Oak Ridge, young talent. Uh, the average age of our PhDs on staff down there is 29, and uh, and and they're they're exceedingly talented, and quite frankly, they want to be a part of a company that is endeavoring to dramatically change the future that we're going to live in. Is that a and that's a powerful that's change? a powerful motivator for hiring people into our into our companies. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. Other questions. Um, Kind of a basic question, probably for Clay, but can you just talk about where your technology is on the cost curve relative to combined cycle, to renewables and others? Just to, how far yeah. out of zone are we right now before we get to something that actually uh, our, is our, commercial? Yeah, our published target, I'll just tell you right now, is, uh, is $0.08 cents per kilowatt hour, $80 per megawatt hour. And so, you know, at a $3 gas and a current generation combined cycle plant, you know, that will come in at, in the high 20s. So that's the difference today. Uh, I, I still think there are, there are a number of opportunities to improve that substantially. Uh, you know, but that natural gas is also putting, you know, half uh, the amount of carbon that a coal plant puts into the environment for free. And, uh, and I think that's a market distortion that needs to be corrected, not just for the nuclear business. It would obvi obviously uh, enter to our benefit if it were corrected, but I think it's, a, it's an important market structure uh, concept that needs to be addressed. So you're, you're really or take, trying to take advantage of the fact that you are not competing with so-called base load, but rather uh, fast ramping gas turbines and others that are able to well, participate very aggressively in wholesale. Uh, I mean, our, our strategy, uh, in some cases, we have a design, a smaller design that, that competes off-grid against diesel. Uh, we also offer uh, greater attributes in terms not just of electricity, but uh, process heat for chemical applications. And so uh, th there are a number of opportunities and beliefs that we have that will allow us, I mean, inspire us to create a future that is not currently visible in an environment of $3 gas. But I've been in this business long enough to know that even with the tremendous uh, resource uh, uh, that we have here in the United States, I would not go long on three dollar. I mean, three dollar gas is not here to stay. Mm -hmm. We've got time for at least one more. Who's got? Some? I have. I have one comment and one question. Without uh, my name is Dirk McDermott. I'm the venture capitalists. I primarily focus in oil and gas technology, but I did make one investment in the nuclear arena and uh, successfully designed a nuclear reactor with the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratories and then tried to get it out into the market and commercialize it. And um, I, I, all I want to say is, oh my God, I, could, I, I thought oil and gas was slow at adopting and the process of getting technology in oil and gas was slow, but I have never probably been more exasperated than I was with trying to go through this process, whether it was the NRC, the DOE, whatever government entity that you want to consider. Um, it, it was disappointing to me as an American because I thought the nuclear industry in the United States it was one of our premier assets, and it was amazing, the challenges that we went through. And I left uh, deflated as an investor and, and with, with empty pockets because it was an unsuccessful investment. Uh, and so when I hear this, it sounds positive, but I, I, I kind of left that experience, experience saying the United States has to fundamentally change how it looks at nuclear because it really needs to get behind this if you want to have a real successful solution to some of our challenges today. And I still don't see it. <laughs> I heard some good ideas. Can I ask how long ago that was? 
um, couple years in nuclear time or no, in, no, no, in, in calendar time. <laughs> in nuclear time, it's two seconds, is what I found. But uh, this was years? the end, uh, 2010. So okay, sort of so like, there's a couple things that have changed. Do well, well, But you, just let me just let me just make a comment. Okay, I, go ahead. can you end it with a question? Because I know everything's good now. No, no, know, no I, but, I'm not but, saying it's good. But, but, but it's the different. the biggest challenge is always was always trying to find investment capital because you had to come to an, yeah. an investor investing, uh, you had to come to investors with a story and there was so much uncertainty. <clears throat> when is the NRC gonna actually look at your application? When are they gonna get anything done? Are they really gonna support this? You know, this just, you just go through this litany of things and, and perhaps this gentleman's been more successful than we were, but. Okay, so it, we, do we, we yeah, got the question, zero time the, left. The, 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 the question really was, comment. what is the government gonna do to allow private investment to really put money into this innovation within nuclear? So we're seeing it, and you can speak more to it because you, I mean, you're backed by investment as well. I think but, we've but talked, we're we're seeing that in companies where we have angel investors, uh, venture capitalists that are funding these companies, um, and they are, they have said, yeah, they have to be a little bit more patient than they do with Silicon Valley uh, companies, but, um, we're we're seeing a lot more of that. Gain is is very much attuned to that. That they these companies have to respond to their investors, and so we are trying to help change that. We are working closely with the NRC. They are changing the way that they do business as well. Um, they have now every six weeks public stakeholder meetings that any one of you can call into if you'd like or pop in at Rockville, Maryland, um, and in response to the fact that we're, they need to be doing business differently. So the developers show up and talk about what they're doing so that the NRC is not surprised when they do get an application. They understand, oh, this is what we've been working with you uh, over the past several months. Clay, you want to make a comment? And I'd like to make one. Uh, the, the capital's going to be there. In the last 10 years, 75 advanced reactor companies have been birthed, uh, birthed. Birth. 25 of them are, you know, have some amount of money behind them, uh, but five to 10 have substantial amounts of money behind them. And uh, I think uh, we need a good partner in the, in the government. Uh, we seek a different kind of investor that thinks beyond uh, traditional venture capital, Silicon Valley, you know, capital cycles. But you know what, they're out there because there are a set of motivations that have inspired leaders and investors around the country to take a big bet on nuclear power. And so not everyone's gonna win. Only two or three will get to the finish line or get to the start line, much less the finish line. But, uh, but the capital is out there. If we, if we do what we need to do on our safety case, we take advantage of innovations in advanced manufacturing. Uh, we get the benefit of the safety case as it relates to licensing and how it relates to the supply chain. Uh, we are investing in engineering. We are in imbe investing in regulatory capital. And, uh, and, and we feel very good about where we are as to when we will need to go to the capital markets to continue uh, building this company. I that's think, my experience. Yeah. I'm sorry it wasn't yours. No, no, I think it's important also to distinguish between investment in technology development and investment in plants. And, and I think we're, we're seeing a surprising resurgence of funding for technology development from private investment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are, there are no fewer than six, as far as I can, am aware, fusion companies, startup fusion companies in this country with, with credible technologies. Um, and, and as someone pointed out, I think Yakpo some of the money for that is coming from the oil and gas sector as large oil and gas companies begin to look at their futures and try to imagine what it is they're going to become at, at a similar scale. Uh, nuclear, a, a new, uh, you know, a really new technology uh, in generation uh, is, is one of the few outlets they have. I think Shell made an announcement about, about something else today, not specifically nuclear, but a transition to electrical generation and distribution. With that, I'd like to thank my panelists and you all for coming and your excellent questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm.